Welcome, I'm Louise, Curator of Natural History for the High Desert Museum. Thanks for joining us for our virtual Natural History Pub. Our sincere thanks, as always, to our museum members who help to make these programmes possible. And also a huge thank you to Fairfield Inn and Suites for supporting this series. You are very welcome to ask questions via the chat. Feel free to submit those throughout the presentation and we'll select some at the end. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Robert Furno. For the past several years, Dr. Furno has been a research associate at the Department of Plant Sciences at the University of California, Davis. He's been an itinerant field biologist, researcher, natural history guide, photographer, professor, but now his sole focus is writing about his long-term projects in the Marble Mountain wilderness. Anyone interested in creating a documentary film about the Marble Mountain wilderness or a film about wilderness more generally, or helping him out with botanical research, don't hesitate to contact him. He kindly wishes to share his email address, which is nivalisben at gmail.com. So that's N-I-V-A-L-I-S-F-E-N at gmail.com. Welcome, Dr. Burnham. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, my name is Rob Furneaux, and I'd like to share with you uh, my uh, passion and love for the Marble Mountain Wilderness area. Um, just to remind us all, this is the way the wor world looks. One view of the world, a non-political view of the world, just in terms of floristic regions of the world. So for me as a, as a biologist, this is the way I kind of look at the world. I want to look at the world. It's the floristic neighborhoods, the centers of endemism throughout the whole world. And you can see in uh, Western North America in the vicinity of Northwestern California and Southwest Oregon, there's a couple major floristic regions that come together. That added to the fact that there's big mountains there is uh, what makes this one of the aspects that makes the Marble Mountain Wilderness and uh, the Klamath Ma uh, Mountains a really interesting place. So uh, uh, this whole talk basically emphasizes the, uh, the he environmental heterogeneity of this wonderful part of the world. And that's important because it basically supports species during times of change and it's worked and functioned as a refugia for species over times of high, high uh, temperatures like the Alta Thermal, low temperatures like the Ice Ages. It's been around for a long time and it has a lot of interesting uh, uh, biota associated with it. So um, if you were from outer space, let's say you uh, were a biologist from Mars and you didn't know much about Mars, and you landed in a little spaceship, and you came to a, a university town or a biology department. So, where do I go? Where's the most diverse place to go on your planet for plants? I love botany, and and they'd say, "Well, it's the tropics," and, and and I might reply, "Well, yeah, I know it's the tropics, but outside of the tropics, what's the mo most diverse area for plants out of the tropics, out of the Amazon, out of the Congo, out of Southeast Asia?" And the answer is Mediterranean climates. So those are the definition of Mediterranean climate is basically uh, during the hottest time of the year, there's very little or no rainfall. So um, these are the Mediterranean climates of the world and they're all hot spots of, of endemism or a lot of them are. Like South Africa is just, I've never been there, it's amazing. And Southwestern Australia and Mediterranean out of the tropics, the California floristic province is the fourth most diverse place in the entire planet for plants. So that makes it an interesting place to study. So um, uh, Norman Myers uh, is an ecologist, I think he's at Oxford, and he came up with, I think it was in 1989 or so around there, um, a definitions to look at the most interest or the most important places on the planet for biodiversity. And there's two rankings. So there's two uh, criteria that, that need to be met. Uh, and one of those is uh, it has to contain at least 1,500 
endemic vascular plants, and then it has to have lost 70% of its original uh, vegetation. And the California, excuse me, the California Floristic Province is one of those global 34 biodiversity hotspots. And that's what we're, I'm going to be talking about in the Marble Mountains, because it's in the center of one of, of, it's in the center of, the center of a biodiversity hotspot. It's in the center of endemism within the center of the California Floristic uh, Biodiversity Hotspot. So that's in Northwestern California, about halfway between Mount Shasta and the ocean. The Klamath Mountain Physiographical Region is in Southwestern Oregon and Northwestern California. And one of the things that makes the, uh, the uh, Klamath region so interesting biologically is that it actually has, it's far enough north in the California Floristic Province and close enough to the ocean and the mountains are high enough that there's orographic precipitation and uh, and it's far enough north that it gets some of those, uh, what do they call them, Pineapple Express uh, weather systems during the summer. So it's it's at the part of more, okay, so in California, uh, there's no other environments that resemble the pre-Mediterranean climate as much as the Klamath region. That's because it's far enough north that it gets some of the, uh, for those reasons I mentioned, it gets enough uh, precipitation from the ocean and uh, from these Pineapple Express uh, um, weather systems. So there's plants there like the Sadler's Oak that are actually relictual from a whole nother climatic regime before the Mediterranean climate. This was when there were summer rains. So it has a lot of interesting plants, some really old plants, some really recent plants and animals. So this whole talk is basically gonna be examining Henry David Thoreau's statement of 1851 and in which he said, wilderness is the preservation of the world. We're gonna really examine that kind of with a magnifying glass. And before unpacking that amazing statement, I'd like to go over a couple geeky um, definitions of the, or discussions of the uh, origins of the concept of wilderness, which were mostly introduced brilliantly by Roderick Fraser Nash. He wrote a book called Wilderness in the American Mind, and there's different editions of it. I think I have a 2001 edition, but I have others, and it's really worth reading if, if you want to get into wilderness. So one of the first uses of, of, of uh, that term um, was in Beowulf, in reference to the savage and fantastic critters inhabiting a dismal forests and cliffs. And then another one, oh, did it, did it, now did it pop out? Okay. Um, the root seems, the root word of this term wilderness seems to be uh, related to will or self-willed, conveys the idea of being lost, unruly, disorderly, or confused, or ungoverned, uncontrolled, or unowned nature. So disorderly and unruly. I really want you to think about those words because we'll explore those a little bit. So the Marble Mountains fits those concepts because it has not only environments that behave themselves <laughs> that, that are predictable and at, at fairly large scales, but it also has unruly environments. So first we're gonna look at uh, the predictable uh, patterns, ecological patterns in the Marble Mountains and in the Klamath Mountains in general. One is life zones. We all know life zones. You drive up a mountain, hike up a mountain. Alexander von Humboldt hiked up a, a beautiful uh, Chimborazo, wasn't it, in Colombia in the tropics. He uh, hiked up this mountain and he noticed the different life zones as he went up, the different vegetation types as he ascended this mountain. And they're fairly, they follow very simple rules of elevation and precipitation. And you can predict what the vegetation is going to be like. And that's called zonal vegetation 
It's corresponding to the climate. The climate is found only in those areas where the typical regional vegetation is fully expressed. So it's not always true though. But here's an, another example of how broad the scales of zonal vegetation is. So one on the left uh, is a, a tropical mountain. And you can see that by ascending the mountain, you, it's kind of equivalent in some ways of ascending at latitude. So Alexander von Humboldt, and I've seen this too, you know, in mountains of New Guinea or places like that in Borneo. When you ascend the mountain at the very top, you're going to find roses, you're going to find willows, you're going to find a lot of the taxa that we're familiar with. And as you go down, things really change. The life zones change. So um, now, we'll example, now we'll examine an unruly environment, one, one that isn't, it doesn't obey the rules and is kind of ungovernable. And that's called azonal. So that means without zones or non-zonal. So in azonal soils and azonal vegetation, or even climate for that matter, the constancy or consistency of the substrate has a stronger effect than that of the climate. So we're looking at here at a ridge in the Marble Mountain Wilderness Area in the center of the Klamath area. And you can see on this ridge on this image, the, the, veg, the, the left side of it, the south side of it is vegetated. And that's on volcanic uh, surfaces with volcanic soils. And to the right or north of it is serpentine, where you can see it's comparatively unvegetated. And it's, so the, the side to the left is a azonal environment. And it's fairly predictable what the vegetation's gonna be like there on the azonal uh, environment. On serpentine, it's not predictable. You have to know what the substrate is to even get a heads up on what may be there. So um, these are called no, uh, non-zonal or azonal sites. But listen to this statement. This is Jack Major, who published this in 1988. He said, they resist change since their local climates deviate so widely from regional um, climates. So they resist changes in climate. Some of these open rocky cliffs, these non-zonal areas, that's interesting. It's really interesting because we're all worried about climate change. And here's some environments and habitats that actually function to resist change and they're azonal. And cliffs are also, that's remember the Beowulf uh, quote, you know, that discussion talked about cliffs. These are both in the Marble Mountains. This uh, picture on the left is a picture of a granitic batholith where there's a lot of cliffs. And the one on the right is marble. But when you think about it, cliffs are some of the most stable habitats we know. They're often free from grazing. They're free from fire. So here's a stable environment that resists changes in climate. It's kind of interesting. And here, let's look at this one. Here, here's one, a little close up. This is Marble Mountain. This is a place I dearly love. If you ever get a chance, go up and ascend to one of the Marble Mountains, especially in the summertime during the full moon. Bring a couple flashlights, but it's just gorgeous. The white rock just reflects the light from the moon and it's just gorgeous. But anyway, we part of the discussion about um, from Beowulf, the stranger or the idea, the old idea of wilderness is fantastic beasts or critters. Well, these are foxtail pines. They're not in that area. They just occur on certain substrates like marble. To the left of this is, is a zonal uh, um, mountain uh, of uh, volcanic rock. And then there's Shasta fir and mountain hemlock and to the Right, there's more of that, but just on this marble, there's strange, um, unexpected life. And there's insects that I could go into too that are really unexpected as well and very interesting. And then also, here's another thing about the, how the substrate can uh, modulate or change uh, um, 
global patterns or, or patterns of much generally much, much broader distribution. So here, you look at the plants, you botanize along this subalpine. Remember, alpine is a uh, above tree line. This is a tree line. Uh, so here you find a lot of uh, plants that are uh, actually normally found globally in the alpine zone. But they shifted down a life zone. Who knows why exactly? There's not much competition. It's, uh, but the same thing occurs in the, uh, if you've ever been to um, Idaho, to the uh, Snake River floodplains, you know, pica, those little critters that are on top, the little rodents that are on top of the, in the alpine and, you know, Mount Caness and the Sierra Nevada, 14,000 feet, but then they're way down there in the Snake River floodplains of, of uh, the salt plains of uh, Idaho. Maybe because the habit, habitat mimics that of an alpine area being so open with this new basalt, the same way that this is an open area. So that's really interesting. That's one of the things that adds to the complexity of this environment. Another thing about marble is, is just, okay, there's, a, there's three lines here, but just look at the, um, the black line in the center. Uh, that's the air temperature. So here's the air temperature um, and you can see that, okay, so in this, the highest uh, temperature is around one to three o'clock or four o'clock in the afternoon, and then it gets cold in the morning. Okay, that's just the normal ambient temperature. But the temperature above marble, it's modulated. So you don't, because water, uh, marble holds a lot of water and it, uh, it's white, it reflects light. So um, it doesn't get as hot in the, uh, the hottest times of day and at night it doesn't get as cool. And I compare that with, uh, oh, and that's, that's the, um, that's the uh, limestone, the black one, the one with uh, a line with the little black dots. Now look at uh, granite. Granite is kind of in between. It, it gets warmer during the hottest time of the day than marble. But it, 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 uh, at nighttime, it gets cooler. So this is just one tiny example of, uh, of how substrates influence microclimates. And microclimates are, of course, important for plants, and they're important for uh, a lot of species, probably most species in the Marble Mountains are, are uh, modulated by these, uh, over time especially, by these changes in microclimate. So it's, it's a really a big deal. And just to blow your mind, just a fascinating thing, is uh, one time I was camping with a field comrade in a, near this place, near the uh, Marble Mountain, and uh, an entomologist came by and he looked at our butterfly nets and plant presses and he said, so, fellow biologist, and then he showed us this insect that he was studying, a gorilla bladded. It's, it's like its common ancestor were grasshoppers and cockroaches. So it's really old, way before the dinosaur time. And its populations across uh, the Russian Far East, Japan, and North America correspond with the glacial maximum. So their, pop, their home bodies, they've been around the Marble Mountains in these certain habitats way over 10,000 years in the same place. And they don't get farther than I don't know, 20 feet or 30 feet, but they go down or up. They don't go horizontally very much. So here's another, um, here's another zonal type um, of a substrate and that influences uh, biodiversity plants and animals. And it's serpentine. And you, there's a picture on the right of North America and it just shows how uncommon it is. Uh, it's, you know, most of the serpentine in North America, Mexico and uh, North America is basically in western, the western part of the United States. Most of it is in uh, California, a little bit in southwestern Oregon and, and elsewhere. But uh, the point is, this is patchy. I mean, look at the, the whole continent. There's serpentine a little bit here and there, and it's not everywhere. So that's another example of how heterogeneous this area is. 
Now, this is a crazy slide, but I, I put it in different colors and stuff. It could go on and on and on, but, but zonal and azonal features of vegetation, which we just went over in soil and even microclimates, are examples of heterogeneity, environmental heterogeneity. And that's the single feature of the Marble Mountain Wilderness Area that I think is just critical for uh, the continuity of life on Earth. And, and if, we can, if the human enterprise is completely homogenizes everything, so that everything's the same, um, you know, agriculture, highways, parking lots, re residential areas, all that, it's getting really homogenized quickly. But in mountains, it resists that kind of homogenization. And that's really important. But even unpacking environmental heterogeneity, I'm looking at 30 different um, variables of environmental heterogeneity and those how, how those modulate or affect uh, the ability of populations of about 70 species of butterflies to, uh, to handle the changes in life. And I've been studying them since 1984. So that's, you know, that's a, <laughs> over 30 generations. For some species at low elevations, it's 60 generations. Think of what that is in human time, 60 generations. So there's a lot of change that these populations are experiencing. We went through that three year drought. When was it 12, 2012, 13 and 14? For some butterfly species, in the Marble Mountains, that was at least three generations. For some, it was six. So a lot of natural selection is happening. A lot of change is happening. Um, so in any way, right, the Marble Mountains in, you know, is really heterogeneous. In fact, I think for its size, it's the most heterogeneous place anywhere on the whole planet for its size. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, but so when people ask me where do where, where should I go in the Marble Mountains, I'm reminded I'm reminded of that that Sanc Sanskrit folktale about the uh, what was it the nine blind men and the elephant, and they're you know they're only able to understand a certain part of this big critter, and that's like I'm only under it's taken me a you know, a lifetime to begin to understand this enormously heterogeneous place. The Marble Mountains is fairly large. It's around the 67th largest wilderness area in the United States, including Alaska. So it's fairly big. And it's, it takes a while to really get to know, and it really does, because it's so intricate um, and patchy. And you can go from, just walk a lot along a geologic fault from one rock type to another, and just hundreds of species change within five feet. And it's like that all over. So back to uh, the uh, Henry David Thoreau quote, in wilderness is the preservation of the world. So you can ask, or I'm asking, is the Marble Mountain wilderness healthy? So was, in a sense, is Henry D David Thoreau right? How do you, uh, how do you uh, determine what is a healthy environment? Um, so uh, butterflies are actually really good uh, indicators of ecosystem health in, ter in terrestrial ecosystems. And the reasons for that, there's a lot of reasons for that. One is they, they're beautiful. So people just are interested in them. They love to study them. And uh, in, in England, for example, there's, they, they were really into it like a couple hundred years ago or longer, you know. And, the different types, because of all this interest in butterflies, there's a lot of knowledge about them. So their taxonomy's fairly well worked out. You're not just getting bogged down with what is this species. Nevertheless, you know, needless to say, that's that's important. But you also want to know a lot more about it. It's life cycles, habitat, it's it's host plants and everything. But that stuff's comparatively well worked out, and they're conspicuous. Those are all practical perspectives, why I chose butterflies and why others use them so much as uh, indicators of environmental health. From a biological perspective, they're pretty diverse. So in the Marble Mountains, I think there's 110 species around there, but um, there's only 70 for which I have enough data to really kind of examine 
statistically about how they handle change. So that means that for the rare species, it's, it's kind of underreported so far because I don't have enough data to really know much about that. Um, so I think butterflies is a group, is a diverse group. I have enough data to look at 70 species of butterflies. And those 70 species, they, they have the properties that are representative for most of uh, life on Earth, the whole planet, pretty much. So, you know, they have variable life cycles. Some only live a few days, some live for years. Some move only 30 to 40 feet from their host plant where the female laid the egg. That's where they live in the subject, uh, subsequent generations within 30 or 40 feet of their host plant. So those are homebodies. And other species, they cross continents or half continents. And they're habitat generalists, not habitat specialists. Most species are, of course, in between these extremes, but I'm finding through these results that more of the species are kind of more like homebodies and they're a little bit more habitat specialists. And that's something I'm working on. Um, some are fussy eaters, some will, is, uh, and some uh, will eat almost anything. Particularly, you should know that, um, that the caterpillars are the fussy eaters, that part of the life cycle, where the female lays the egg, she's doing an egg assessment. She's trying to figure out the chemistry, gets her little chemistry set out, and she's scratching, and she's trying to you know, determine what the chemistry, she's doing an assessment of the, uh, of, uh, the potential place where she's gonna uh, lay her eggs. So some species are uh, fussy eaters, some are generalists. As adults, they're more general. The females laying their eggs where the caterpillars are grow, that's, this is, there's not as nearly as many species of plants that they uh, lay their eggs on as, as they feed on as adults. So let's see if this comes up. Yeah, it's not coming, this is a video. So these are some children out there ch chasing butterflies. And the reason I throw this in is people like butterflies. You know, they're really, besides being very practical for environmental, uh, assessing environmental health, they're something that people really enjoy. They're something that makes life more pleasant. They're beautiful. Okay, so we're interested in environmental health. Well, when I was an undergrad, I, I had human physiology and I, uh, and one of the uh, exercises, one of our labs involved a stress test. So what happens is you walk into this room and they say, they get on this uh, treadmill and the treadmill's gonna go faster and the angle's gonna get steeper and you're gonna, and we're gonna attach all these electrodes to you and everything to monitor, monitor your uh, vital signs to, to assess your health. And we're gonna try to figure out how quickly after your, uh, the machine stops, your physiology recovers, your heart rate slows down and so on. So um, get on the machine and run and just stay up with the machine. Try to keep pace with the machine until you feel like you're gonna die or fall off the machine <laughs> and then tell us to stop. So I did that and I, I, I did pretty well. So as I was working on the statistics with a statistician, a consultant of mine, he, uh, he and I were working on this for quite a while and um, then I thought of this analogy. Well, actually, looking at all these butterflies in the Marble Mountains for many years, I was looking at the trends, you know, of like 70 species over time. So the, you, you look at it and it's kind of a flat line and then all of a sudden, boom, you know, around 1997, there's this blip or a little um, change in the uh, population. So there's a population change for a lot of species around the same time. And then I figured, oh, that was the El Nino event. That was a huge uh, a weather event. It was a stressful weather event and it caused the shifting of a lot of species, both marine species and terrestrial species. There's lots of papers on this. So it turns out I had a baseline data set starting from 1984, way past, you know, up to the present. So then when I wanted to look at what the status quo is, the baseline data, you know, the niche, defining the niche of the species, what elevations is it on, what substrates is this located, how, 
how, uh, what time of year does it fly? Um, about 30 variables like that. Does it occur on mountain summits or valleys or streams or so or and south facing slopes, all those kind of things. So putting all that together, I compared uh, over th around 30 years of baseline data with just what happened right around the El Nino event. So from 1997 to about three years after, comparing those two uh, data sets is like comparing the, uh, the baseline data set when you're about to set on a step onto the treadmill to when the stress happens and after you get, get off the treadmill, how your uh, um, heart rate, for example, um, how resilient it is, how, it, how quickly it recovers. So this is kind of a rough analogy, okay? But it, it's, it, I think it's reasonable. So, um, so basically the, the uh, consequences were, oh, oh, here's an example of the, uh, tr this is uh, along the Klamath River which is in between Oregon and, and uh, um, the Oregon line and the northern part of the Marble Mountains along the Klamath. This is, I couldn't get a good enough picture of this to show, but this is the El Nino flood. This is one, and it, it was really, it was a big event. So it went up pretty high. So I'm trying to understand how populations of species responded to this stress. And it's a measure of ecosystem health. So, there are a lot of different things to unpack about this. There were a lot of knit shifts, and some of them are really very interesting, like for azonal environments, for serpentine, and for uh, for um, marble, for example. Butterfly populations that have spent three years on um, on serpentine. Then came the knit shift. And then those that had spent three years, at least three years on serpentine, then they shifted their niche to marble. But they didn't sh shift their niche in elevation. And uh, some species with broad niches, they, uh, they moved to higher elevations. Uh, the homebodies, the kinds I was mentioning before, um, they shifted their, time, their, their life cycle. There was actually nat natural selection on their life cycle. So they emerged earlier in the year. A lot of them uh, emerged or flew later in, in the year. And there are a lot of other types of uh, shifts as well. And that's what I'm currently working on is summarizing all that. Um, so um, the diagnosis, uh, it's just like the doctor studied my uh, recovery after st the stress of the treadmill test and look at how... Um, resilient my physiology was to that stress. I studied the Marble Mountains wilderness after the stress of this extreme weather event, which came by and it kind of set the clock. The differences were huge. It rained a lot, there were floods, there was tons of snow. Snow would cover whole habitats that, that normally were not covered. So it really offset a lot of things. And I think the, in a lot of species, I, over half shifted, shifted their niches significantly. I'm not talking just a little bit. I mean, there were significant shifts. And uh, I think the Marble Mountains is a case history. It's resilient because first, it's large and it's free from pesticides. Second, it contains a lot of habitats. We looked at a few of those. Um, contains a lot of rock types and soil types. Supports over a thousand species of vascular plants. Uh, has a large elevational range. The lowest point is 640 feet, and the highest point is 8,290 feet above sea level. 8,299 feet above sea level. Lots of microclimates. So butterflies have had a lot of options. And the conclusion, my overall conclusions is, if butterflies have enough, or if life on Earth has enough different habitats and environments, and these environments are large enough so that the populations can be fairly large, then there's gonna be a lot of differences in things. And, and one thing that I haven't talked about that I, I probably shouldn't mention here is that um, 
there's levels of heterogeneity, not only in, in the environment, but actually in the life there. I mean, look at human beings. We're one species, but, you know, there's a lot of cultures. There's a lot of different ways of being human. And the same thing with most other life forms. You know, there, there's sub, some species in the Marble Mountains. They have se several subspecies. Some others, just there's just one like monarch. It doesn't have any subspecies. It's just you know fairly homogeneous, probably genetically compared to something like a uh, mariposa copper, for example, that has several subspecies. And and then there's even individuals that are different from the populations of subspecies. So there's variation on the individual level, on the population level, on the species level. And it's like a meeting of all this genetic diversity and living things within a, an amazingly diverse environment. And then a big change comes, the El Nino event, which was, you can read about it, it was, it's, it's fascinating. But, um, but then what happened afterwards? And I think it can absorb all this change for the reasons I mentioned, just heterogeneity, size, and absence of pesticides. There are places in the marbles that are um, disturbed. So this is an example. Uh, it's, I'm gonna say overall it is healthy, but overgrazing has impacted some of the environment. Now, I'm relying upon the findings of a soil scientist. He used to be the, uh, his name is Tom Laurent, and he published a paper, his name is Tom Laurent. His, published a paper on this area that you're looking at in the slide. This is what I call the amphitheater. It's around English Peak in the southern part of the wilderness. Uh, just from here, you get a good view of uh, the northern part of the Trinity Alps, if you're aware of that. Um, but anyway, the cows came in here and they grazed and grazed and grazed and they, for a long time, and they actually exported a lot of, you know, elements. I don't know, I can't remember much about this, but the pH of the soil changed and it became more acidic. And then there was soil erosion. So there was a conversion actually of one vegetation type to another. It wasn't a qualitative change, it really changed. And I've been monitoring this since uh, 1984. And it's really not functioning very well. So it's, I didn't wanna to paint too rosy of a picture but the big picture, it is pretty rosy. I mean, the marble mountains is healthy. So, um, so in wilderness is the preservation of the world. I think wilderness areas are ungovernable. They have interesting habitats. They're very homogeneous. They haven't been mown, mowed over very much. And that's really good news. What I think is we need a lot more wilderness areas. E.O. Wilson, who coined the term biodiversity, he said we maybe need twice as many natural areas in the world as we have now. So um, here's some references that there's a lot of things to read that are really good, but these are just a pile of books that, that a small pile and laws that I think are really important for wilderness one way or another. Um, this one down here, I haven't read the one on the bottom, the Rights of Nature, a History of Environmental Ethics. That's pretty interesting. I've just started to read that. Of all these, it's hard to pick. Wilderness in the American Mind, any edition is that great. I have the fourth. Silent Spring, of course, changed the whole world. When Rachel Carson published that, she's a fantastic writer. Sand County Almanac by Aldo Leopold. Um, oh, acknowledgments. I'd like to acknowledge Michael Barber, who has uh, supported me uh, uh, just professionally as a friend and a font of knowledge at UC Davis, and I still work with him. Wonderful. Louise Shirley, who gave me uh, some good tips on how to improve this talk. So if the talk's messed up, it's all her fault. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> no, it's my responsibility. I don't. And Neil Willis, a statistician with whom I've been working. Professor Arthur Shapiro at Davis, when I was trying to figure out what to do with my life, I knew as a kid that I wanted to study, to do a long-term study. I was an undergraduate. 
I loved reading scientific papers on Friday afternoons. I'd go through the zoological record that started to be published, I think, in the 1800s. And I went through all, I just read tons of scientific papers. And then after doing that, because I was trying to figure out what to do with my life as a biologist, and then I trying to figure out what, that's why people go to schools, to kind of part of it is to, for sure, to figure out what you're interested in. So, um, so I figured it out. I figured the study, the papers that I find the most interesting are the uh, long-term studies. They come from long-term studies. So I said, wow, I, I want to do a long-term study. It's kind of like getting married though. It's like you, if you do a long-term study, you uh, gotta be sure of what you're marrying. <laughs> you want to have a divorce. So I start, I worked as a biological technician in coral reefs and in Cypress Tupelo swamps and the deserts and the Arctic and the Antarctic. I mean, just all these different environments to figure out where I want to do a long-term study. And I usually got jobs as a biological technician or led ecotourism trips or something. So um, after dating, I'll call that my dating, kind of sleeping around, but you know, conducting research in different environments. I went to Davis and I talked with Art Shapiro and I said, I'm thinking of uh, Mount Shasta. And he said, no, don't study Mount Shasta. And he was right, you know, because it's pretty boring compared to the Marble Mountains and the Klamath area. And he introduced me, he said, check out the marbles. So I went there and it was love at first sight. My dating was over and I was not going to be promiscuous anymore. I was just into the marble mountains. I'm not going to do research in all these sites. So that's kind of a goofy way of saying that's talking about my love affair with this place. So um, I think, oh, and I want to thank the many, many, many volunteers. I think easily over 60, 70 volunteers I've had in the marbles come out for from days to weeks. Um, just an amazing bunch of people. I've learned a lot from and had a lot of good times with. Uh, and then the, the California Conservation Corps. Um, this is one of their camps. And they're the ones that you know, work on the trails for you know, Pacific Crest Trail, for example, John Muir Trail. And they're, they're, I've given talks to them and kind of make deals where if I give a talk to you guys, do I get a free meal? Because <laughs> you have to carry your backpack in there. So that's about all I wanted to talk about. And uh, I guess we'll have time for questions. And I hope that you'll give me a, an email sometime if you're interested in going out. And thanks for your interest. So they're going to be able to see me now. I think so soon. I just briefly heard Kyle. I think we're switching over. Okay. So you're going to ask me the questions and they can't hear you or I when we're talking or. I think we're live with the Q and A. Um, and let's get started, Robert, with perhaps, um, you know, I was wondering, you talk a lot about resilience in your presentation. How do you think the Marble Mountain Wilderness will fare in the face of climate change? Well, it has a record of going through a lot of changes, that area. And for example, there was the, we're in an interglacial right now. This is the middle of the Holocene. So some people call it the alt altothermal. Other people call it the hypsothermal, the climatic optima, or whatever it's called. Um, just 7,000 to 5,000 years ago, the uh, temperature was a lot warmer out west in the Western United States. So uh, one, one to two degrees centigrade warmer. So that's, I think, when the well, that's when the Great uh, Basin Pleistocene lakes dried up. That's when uh, some of the vegetation types in the eastern Klamath region and the eastern part of the Marble Mountains got uh, situated, like in their kind of outliers of the Great Basin. So it's, and I think they're still hanging on. I know they're still hanging on. So, and then there's other uh, indicators of, of the, uh, um, Glacial maxima 
So you got really cold areas in the Marble Mountains where tax or, or, or life is still hanging on. You have really warm areas where I'll take the butterflies and the vegetation and show it to specialists. And they say, that looks like that's from the Great Basin. So it has a record of being able to uh, absorb change over time. And you remember all it takes is a few individuals to actually found a, a larger population. So a pregnant female, I mean, Hawaii, the whole biota of the, of the Hawaiian islands came from long distance dispersal. There's even a couple endemic butterflies there. There had to be a pregnant female that flew all the way from a mainland to the most isolated archipelago in the world. So when we look at places like the Marble Mountains, there's so much more terrestrial structure there and, and, and complexity of different geological substrates and that I'm very hopeful. Uh, I think the big thing is we need bigger areas. Uh, and I really think that wilderness in, is in preservation of the world. The only thing is we can't, we have to, okay, there's one thing we should do. We should uh, restore some of the sites that have been overgrazed. Uh, I don't believe that we should be finicky and fussy about everything, but I mean, some places are, were hurt and they've never been repaired. And that might be very difficult to do. But um, I really feel like this is a positive outcome. I didn't know, I'm just following the statistics. I'm trying to get the statistics right. So that's my opinion. I think it really is functioning like a Noah's Ark. It sounds a little Pollyanna-ish maybe, but uh, there, <laughs> there are those, some habitats that are having difficulty like the overgrazed area that I was talking about. But other than that, I mean, okay, here, here's an anecdote. Uh, when I first went to the Marble Mountains in 1984, it was in September, and I hiked in and I, I saw this one butterfly population. I, I uh, documented that along this valley. It was on a um, river terrace. And the terrace was, uh, had some native grasses on it. And this butterfly that I found, this population of butterflies is called the um, uh, California ringlet. And its host plants are grasses. But then with all the fire suppression going on and the trees being held back, the grass habitat, even in 1984, I noticed that, that, wow, you know, there's, and then, okay, so then I didn't find that population of, in that part of the Marble Mountains for over 25 years. Until just a few years, actually, in June of this year, I started, I was hiking up and it was a couple years after this huge forest fire in a part of the Marble Mountains, there were more grasses and that population had come back. So the bad news about all these fires is, we know what that is, but the good news is some of these areas really are due for a burning and nature's kind of getting back at us. Mm -hmm. So I think I've said enough about that maybe. Well, that's great. <laughs> uh, we have a question from Josh Newton. Hello, Josh. Um, it says, Robert, are you observing wildfire behavior changes in the Marble Mountain wilderness since 1984? Yeah, that one I just mentioned. Um, and yes, there are other, it's amazing. Yeah, I've been going out and taking <laughs> historical pictures now. So I have pictures of areas that I was monitoring for butterflies and plants in the mid 90s that had been burnt by fire. Now I go back and they've burned again. So I'm going and I'm comparing the plants that were there before with the way the plants and the butterflies, the plants and some of the pollinators. And it depends actually on the vegetation, on the um, geological substrate. For those azonal soils that I went, or habitats that I went into so thoroughly, or cliff habitats, some of those are comparatively free from fire, but some of them aren't. So I've been studying those very carefully. And uh, 
I think there's less change. I mean, for sure. I mean, the same dominance, like in Serpentine, Quercus Dorada that I was studying its impact coming back or Service Berry Amelanchier, it was coming back from fires that had been probably, I don't know, 20 years earlier. So I'm talking about the 60s. And then I was there in the 80s, the 90s. And so some of the environments, they change but it's just the same things. They're kind of cycling around. It's more of a cycle, I think. But in other types of environments that are more zonal, where there's more continuity of, uh, of uh, uh, fire suppression landscape of fuels. So there's lots of fuels, lots of trees, lots of like white fir and incense cedars, a lot of trees that have thin bark that can't handle fire at all. You know, but it's it seems to be quite patchy. But there are areas of the Marble Mountains that are really alarmingly naked, and you see uh, signs of erosion happening. And but it's amazing how a few years later, you know, fireweed is just abundant, and there's certain mosses that come back right after fire. Certain species of mosses. Uh, can't remember the genus right now, the moss, but it's really interesting. I don't think it's, we were due for a fire in parts of the marbles and, and that's that. I mean, it, it, it's hard, but I just think it's, it's part of the system and we held it back for so long. Now it's readjusting, but yeah, it, it, that's a complicated question. I hope I answered it a little bit. Thank you so much again for sharing your work this evening. Um, finally, do you have any calls to action for our attendees this evening? Any final thoughts you'd like to share? Well, it's a good thing to be a member of some of the, like the Wilderness Society. They do a good job. Um, they come out with some really good publications now and then. Uh, I actually contact my representatives uh, about natural areas, wilderness areas, and oh, here's an idea. So when I was in graduate school, they were going after Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, that wilderness. And that's like the flagship in a way. It's just gigantic. And they wanted a uh, this was in the late 80s and early 90s. They wanted to go for mineral oil, gas exploration and development on the North Slope. Well, uh, and, the, and the Trump administration wants to go after that too. So what I did is I, I, so I worked up there for a couple of years. I took it on the road. I gave a lot of lectures. And at UC Davis, when I was a graduate student, I, this is a good idea for all of you. You really want to try to, if you care about something and it's just really, you really care about it. I got, I, I got a group together. We called ourselves the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge Support Group. And we, it was completely self-funding. We sold, we baked little caribou cookies. I bought some cookie cutters from my sister for Christmas and we sold those, those paid, paid for stamps and everything. And we got, believe it or not, 15,000 handwritten letters sent, handwritten, sent to representatives and uh, the president and so on to support Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, defeat the bills. I forget which they were. There was one in the house. And, but to defeat the bills that would compromise the wilderness area and support the um, bills that, that uh, would protect it. And that made a difference. Uh, called up the people in Washington D.C. that were sponsoring the bills, and they, you know, said, "Wow, there's a lot coming out of Davis right now." And and, and then what you can do once you're really good at that, then you can take what you've learned. And then I gave talks about how other people can set up similar type of letter writing campaigns. So I took one to the uh, Golden Gate National Recreation Area there north of San Francisco and I think in Yosemite Institute. And you can, so you can take that around 
to different groups and teach them the lessons that you've learned. Cause you learn a lot. You, you know, you get a California map out, people don't even know who the representatives are, you know, and all that. And you, and you just get really organized. And I didn't give a piece of paper away. Everybody that came to the booth, I said, we're not giving any pieces of paper away. Just write it right now or get out of here. I didn't say it that bluntly, but it worked. So I think if you, and it's wonderful emotionally because the people that you, uh, find to collaborate with in these grassroots movements or enterprises, whatever you want to call them. Uh, they're really cool people. They're really, really wonderful human beings. So it's nice emotionally because you don't feel so alone in your love for wilderness. And then it actually does make a difference. And particularly if you get around and teach other people how to do it. And that's, and then supporting, you know, the conservation groups that you like, there's quite a few out there and everybody has their favorites. Um, I can say another thing is that uh, this is kind of deep and maybe it's off the point a little, but Probably a lot of the people in the audience right now are, have been, you know, have had a remarkable life and being able to enjoy the beauty of this world. And we're really lucky for that. So some of my study sites in the Marble Mountains were right next to the Pacific Crest Trail. So I started studying there in 1984. So there's people just hiking around. And some of those sites I just keep on returning to. I have to. I like the ones that are more remote because I think of the Pacific Crest Trail as kind of like Interstate 5. You know, lots of hikers, you know, 40 miles a day, really light patch, you know. And then I talk to them. And one thing I, I tell them is that when you bump into people, you're like an ambassador for the wilderness area. You, they're all the natural areas that you're hiking from Mexico to Canada. And rather than say things like, it's awesome, dude, or it's really cold, or just try in your heart and your mind to find some kind of language that's personal because you're representing wilderness. So that's a thing that I, that's, that's something we should all be working on. It's a way to convey the things that move us personally. And I think that word of mouth type of thing is, is a way of going about conservation. That's another way, but I think it's an important way. So that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> Thank you again, Dr. Furno, and thanks to all those who have joined us this evening. And with that, we'll say good night. Thank you. All right, I hope to see some of you out in the Marble Mountains sometime. <laughs>